Greetings, I'm Mariswin de Kodor, and I'd like to welcome you to Penzik University class, Tips and Tricks, Things I Wish I'd Known the First Time I Came to Penzik. The first time I came to Penzik, I didn't know what to expect, so I packed as if I were going camping with the Boy Scouts. I brought a nylon tent, sleeping bags, and a cooler, as well as our entire Renfair wardrobe. I hadn't pre-registered, so we paid at the gate, then set out to find a place to camp. I didn't know my way around, and I found it stressful to creep along narrow roads, searching for a place to camp that hadn't already been claimed by somebody else. So after a lot of driving around, and getting out of the car, and walking around, and getting back in the car, we finally found a tiny space on which to pitch our nylon tent. Lesson number one, join an encampment. It's a lot more fun to arrive at Penzik knowing where you're supposed to be than it is to drive around for an hour searching for a place in single camping. But if you're part of an encampment, not only do you have a place to go, but when you get there, you'll be with people you know. Also, encampments usually have amenities like hot showers and communal dining. Long before Penzik starts, make arrangements to camp with a group. Look first to your local barony or shire, but you might also choose to camp with a special interest group. There's an encampment for musicians, and there's one for reenactors who never break character. There's even an encampment for waifs and strays, people who have no one else to camp with. I knew that Penzik was a tent city. I'd seen it from the highway the year before. What I didn't know was that the important part wasn't tent, it was city. For example, I'd expected to cook over the campfire like we did in Scouts. But before we even dug a fire pit, we learned there was a restaurant district in the center of town, right between the two enormous shopping malls. We ate extremely well the whole time we were there, and we never did light the campfire. Lesson number two, Penzik is a camping event, but it's the sort of camping where, if you want, you can eat in restaurants and sleep in beds. Setting up camp is a lot of work, especially when it's hot and you've been driving all day. My feeling is that if I have to spend an hour at home to save a few minutes of setting up time in camp, it's worth it. People say that you can make a flagpole from PVC pipe and plop it over a tent pole pin. Even if the fit is a little bit sloppy, it won't blow away. I didn't believe it. I thought, surely it needed a longer pin, a tighter fit, or some kind of fastener at the bottom. But no, people are right. All you need to do is plop the pole over the pin. Finials prevent water from getting into your tent through the tent pole grommets. I can't reach the top of my tent poles, so I have a hard time installing the finials. Usually I do a few of them and then quit. I switch to using cone washers. Cone washers plug the space between the finial and the grommet. Several thunderstorms later and no water has gotten into my tent. Best of all, you can put the cone washers on the pins when you're still at home. It's one more chore you don't have to do when you're setting up on site. I initially got a slant-walled tent because I thought they looked nice and because they have a lot of floor space inside. However, the slant walls need to be staked down right away or they droop, which spoils the look. Staking the walls can take hours, by which I mean I'm still working on it the next day. After a few seasons, I replaced the slant walls with straight walls. They look good from the moment they're hung, even before they're staked down. Straight walls do need to be staked down eventually, but the chore can be demoted from a must do immediately to a I'll get to it when I get to it. 
Another thing I like to do is take a Sharpie and mark the ground cloth to show where the tent poles should go. That way, there's no guesswork when you're setting up the tent. Using bed rail connectors, I can make furniture that snaps together. It used to take 15 minutes to put this bed together with screws, but now I can snap it together in under a minute. Over the tent pole hooks are a wonderful thing. I might forget to install them when I'm putting up the tent, but it's not that hard to put them on later. These shelves are hanging from over the tent pole hooks. The tapestry and the fire extinguishers hang from them also. They're very useful. I use tent pole grabbers, also called gravity hooks, to hang the iron chandeliers. Chandeliers that go around the pole aren't a good choice for me because I forget to install them until after the tent is up and the tent pole has become impossible to lift. And of course there's more to setting up than just pitching the tent and unpacking. There's usually a kitchen to set up and also a bathhouse. Almost all encampments have a sheet wall of some sort, which means digging post holes. There are ditches to be dug and sometimes bridges to be repaired. This is heavy labor and it can take up the whole of Peace Week. What if it's more than you think you can handle by yourself? What you need are minions. Minions are not that hard to find. You download the Minions app to your phone and use it to hire a minion like you'd order an Uber. Some people pay for their trip to Pensick by working as minions, and they might not be able to go otherwise. Now we're going to look at some ideas for decorating the inside of the tent. Warning, every effect shown in this section is fake. The original of this tapestry hangs in the Museum of Cluny in Paris. You can make a convincing copy by taking a JPEG to the office store and having it printed as a vinyl banner. This one was made by Vistaprint.com. They printed it up for me on a 4x4 sheet of vinyl, all for under $50. It's waterproof, so I don't worry about it getting damaged. There's nothing more genuinely period looking than a real rope bed. These, however, are fake. The ropes are threaded like a running stitch the length of the boards. I chose not to make a real rope bed because threading the ropes would take too long. Similarly, there's nothing like real, hand-painted artwork on a wooden chest. These designs are decoupage. Decoupage is French for decorated with paper cutouts. This linen fold paneling isn't real either. It was also done using decoupage. And so was this carved wooden chest. When it comes to decorating furniture, if you have a can of polyurethane and a color printer, you can do this. I feel hinky about burning down my tent. That's why I use fake candles. Even though they aren't real, I think they look pretty convincing. As an added convenience, the LED candles turn on and off with a remote. I like to use the same remote for every candle in the tent, both the chandeliers and the tapers. It's a small thing, but a great convenience when you're already in bed and want to turn the lights off. Even when the candles are different brands, I can usually get the remote from one brand to work on candles of a different brand. You just have to try all the buttons, not just the on-off. My fondness for fake candles extends to fake torches. I got these so I could hang them from shepherd's hooks flanking the entrance to the tent. But I also use them to mark the tent stakes so no one will trip over them at night. I know I've gone flying when I hit a tent stake, and it's not much fun. One of the best things I brought to Penzik was a RAV charger. This one could charge a laptop twice, or a cell phone five times. It will charge anything that has a USB port. Lanterns, fans, or more importantly, children's electronic games. 
Some people sit in their cars with the engine running to charge their electronics. And some set up solar panels around their tent. I liked the RAV charger better because it was small enough to carry in my writing box and it was totally reliable. Once when I woke up in the middle of the night, I reached for a flashlight, but it got away from me and rolled under the bed. I spent considerable time on my hands and knees, pawing the ground cloth in pitch darkness, searching for it. Not fun. If it had been wrapped in glow tape, I wouldn't have had that problem. Also, it's a very good thing to have the flashlight on a lanyard. I'm referring to the risk of losing it in a porta castle. That would be, according to Martha Stewart, a bad thing. I attached lines to the vent flap so I could open and close it. However, my technique left something to be desired. When I wanted to close the flap, I tied the line to one of the finials that I'd failed to install earlier and threw it over the ridge pole. During the day, this worked reasonably well and was mildly amusing to my campmates, provided I didn't hit anyone. I found it much less amusing at night when fat raindrops struck the tent canvas, heralding a thunderstorm, and I rushed outside barefoot in my shift. Then someone showed me how to rig the lines so the tent flap could be opened from inside. That was terrific advice. The last tip for this section is bring a sleep mask. The sun rises early at Pensick, or at least it seems like it, and the morning light comes right through the thin canvas tent walls. If you want to sleep in, by which I mean later than 6 a.m., bring a sleep mask. Either that, or close the curtains around your canopy bed. Staying organized. This is a short section because I'm not that organized. I spend so much time planning how the inside of my tent is going to look. I imagine something right from the pages of Better Homes and Castles. But after the first day, the tent looks more like exploding dorm room. Yet none of it is laundry or unmade beds. It's the tent poles that never got used, or the baskets that once held the ropes. I heard some excellent advice, which was, don't park the car until you've totally finished setting up. That way, you can put the stuff that's left over back in the car, rather than leaving it underfoot in the tent. This is one of my favorite ways to stay organized. Clear zipped bags for travel. This one holds a sewing kit. Other bags hold shower stuff, contact lens stuff, or a first aid kit. But there was a problem. Whenever I wanted a given pouch, I couldn't remember where I'd put it. I'd tear the tent apart and find the five I didn't want before I found the one I did. Finally, it occurred to me to put all of them in the same place, in the wooden chest at the foot of my bed. That way, I'd be able to find them without so much drama. I also like shelves for storage mainly because I can see what's on them. But one word of advice, only put things on shelves that won't break. A friend of mine put a bottle of good scotch on a shelf hung from the poles of his tent. Tents and tent poles move in the wind. So his advice is, don't store expensive scotch on shelves. I also like pegboards for the same reason I like shelves. I can see what's on them. The pegboard also lets clothes air out and dry. Finally, invest in some baskets for shoes. One basket for each person staying in the tent. When there aren't shoes all over the floor, it seems to reduce the clutter by at least half. One of the rules of travel is, you always forget one thing. And if it's only one thing, you're ahead of the game. Whatever you forgot to bring, you can probably find it at Cooper's store in the middle of Penzik. And if they don't have it, Walmart, Target, and Home Depot are all nearby. If you leave Penzik to go shopping in town, it's the custom to wear garb. No one will stare. Penzik has been going on for almost 50 years, and people in town are used to us.
If I were to advise my younger self what to get for my first set of garb, here's what I'd say. Start with a belted tunic. Wear it over a pair of black jeans, or better yet, yoga pants, because they look like leggings. Hang a pouch from your belt, and you're all ready to go. Later, I replaced my ordinary belt with a ring belt that ties in an overhand knot. This is a very medieval look. In addition to hanging a purse, you can hang a dagger from the belt, or a drinking horn, or a tankard. Period jewelry is another way to add to the look. For example, a Thor's hammer, Viking beads, or a penannular brooch. My garb was starting to look pretty good. The finished outfit bore an uncanny resemblance to the garb of a Jedi Knight, which, for purposes of this discussion, is totally irrelevant. Let's say you have your garb completely put together. You've assembled tunic, belt, pouch, and dagger. You're pretty happy with how it turned out. And then you see people who have taken their garb to a whole nother level, and you wonder, what's their secret? In large part, it's headgear and footgear. Modern people don't wear headgear much and don't particularly notice when it's missing. But a hood or a veil adds a lot to the overall look. And modern shoes simply don't look medieval. There's nothing wrong with them. To my modern eye, they're not noticeable at all. But authentic medieval footwear adds to the authenticity of the whole outfit. Headgear includes hats, hoods, veils, and coifs, which are worn by everyone, men, women, and children. I would also include a mention of false braids. They look surprisingly natural, so I decided to try them out myself. I think that worked out pretty well. Or suppose you want the look of two coils of braids one over each ear, framing your face, or what my mother called cootie garages. Then you buy two headbands, attach them together by the elastic, and drape them over the top of your head. I tried that too, and I thought it worked out pretty well. You do have to wear a veil, though, to hide the elastic. Authentic medieval shoes will also raise your garb to the next level. This is a turn shoe so named because it's sewn inside out and then turned. Notice how the lace is tied with only one loop. This is absolutely authentic for medieval shoes. Turn shoes come in many styles, but they all have the distinctive seam between the sole and the upper. I expected the soles to be uncomfortably thin on the graveled roads of Penzik. I was pleasantly surprised when they turned out to be comfortable for the whole day. You can buy turn shoes at Penzik. Several different merchants carry them. You can also find them online. When you first arrive at Penzik and pass through the gate at Troll, they'll give you an event guide and schedule. One of the best things you can do is read through it and mark the things that look interesting. That way, when you get back home, you won't hear of something you would have liked to do and realize, I was right there and I missed it. At Penzik, there's something different to do every day. Here are some of the highlights from War Week. On Friday, you can follow a pilgrimage route which ends at the cathedral. On Saturday, you can join the St. Sebastian's archery shoot. On Saturday afternoon, they choose up sides for the war. On Saturday night, you can watch the slave auction at Vlad's Pleasure Palace. All proceeds go to charity. On Sunday, there's an Arts and Sciences exhibit. And Monday is the Rapier Competition. Tuesday is the Battle in the Woods. Tuesday night is the Feast of the Phoenix, a 14th century costume ball. Wolgamort performs on Wednesday, and on other days as well. Wednesday is the children's water battle. Wednesday evening is midnight madness, when the merchants stay open well into the night. 
choral, recorder, and theater groups practice all week and late in the week give public performances. On Thursday night, we mourn for those who have died by sending a burning Viking ship out onto Cooper's Lake. The highlight of War Week comes on Friday with the Penzik War, the battle between the East and Middle Kingdoms in which over 4,000 armored warriors take the field. In addition to the event guide and the thing, you can also learn what's going on by reading the Penzik Independent. The Penzik Independent goes on sale about 10 o'clock in the morning and reports on the major events of the previous day. Your camp is set up, you've read the schedule and know what you want to do, and now you're ready to get on with your day. They give you a map of Penzik when you check in at Troll. It took me years to notice that the roads of Penzik appear in Google Maps. Even though Penzik, like Brigadoon, exists for only a short time each year. As a newcomer, you can use your phone as a GPS to navigate through the site. The red dot will even show you where you are. I was out walking one night when someone asked me the way to Brewer's Road. I gave the best directions I could. Down Roxeter, left on Longway, left on Fosse, and Brewer's should be on the right. Much later, I realized I'd given bad directions. We were only 50 paces from the head of Brewer's Road. If I'd known to look at Google Maps, I'd have realized that. In spite of it being a period setting, phones have many uses at Penzik. Living outdoors, we're highly attuned to the weather. Phones can be used to learn the temperature and humidity and to see the radar weather map. There are always going to be thunderstorms at Penzik. It's just a matter of when. People also use their phones to read the thing to see the up-to-the-minute Penzik University schedule. I allow my children to range more freely at Penzik than I do at home. I use the phone to find them when it's time for dinner. And phones can be used to receive texts warning when the cannons are about to be fired. And you couldn't plan a Pokemon Go raid without a phone. Of course, cell phones aren't period so I like to disguise mine as a prayer book. I got this one on Etsy. It said that you can arrive at Penzik with nothing but a well-endowed purse and buy whatever you need in the marketplace. Tents. Garb. Pewter dishes. Armor. Swords. Sun hats. Celtic harps and lessons. Spices. Another small but important tip for when you're out and about is to have something with you to carry things in. I like to bring a canvas tote bag. Over the course of the day, I usually pick up multiple handouts from classes as well as things I've bought from the merchants. Elizabethan women carried a basket over their arm when they went out. It's said that you could put a whole lot in one basket. Medieval people also carried baskets like modern backpacks. You can get them at Penzik from our own basket man. I like to wear a Fitbit at Penzik. If I'm going to take 21,000 steps in a day, I want to get credit for it. With so much walking, be good to your feet. If you're debating between authentic and comfortable, go with comfortable. And just in case, moleskin is excellent for blisters. But you don't have to walk everywhere. There's a bus that runs through Penzik. It's free and it goes everywhere, including up to the highlands and around the lake. But the bus isn't just a way to get around. But even if you don't have to go anywhere, you can ride the bus to get a scenic tour of Penzik. The first time I went to Penzik, I was only there for a three-day weekend. And trying to see Penzik on a long weekend is like trying to see Disneyland on your lunch hour. So taking the bus tour was a really good thing. There's something else you may not have heard if this is your first time at Penzik. Many people who come here are home brewers. 
However, none of them have liquor licenses, which means they can't sell alcohol. So all of the beer, mead, and cider in the taverns is free. I heard one proprietor say that running a tavern is a losing proposition. So it's courteous to tip generously. Now let's talk about how to deal with the heat at Penzik. Or, as the joke goes, I'm not saying it's hot today, but two hobbits just came into camp and threw a ring in my tent. The water at Cooper's Lake is clean and safe to drink, but it tastes like iron, except at the archery range where they have city water. When I first saw people wearing tankards or drinking horns on their belts, I assumed it was a Ren Faire thing, which meant, I like to go to the taverns. Not so. It's a hydration thing. There are water stations all over Penzik, and while they're filled with cold water, there aren't any cups. Here's something I wish I'd heard of earlier. If you buy a souvenir mug at the Beast and Boar, for the rest of Penzik, you can refill it for free. In addition to lemonade, they have iced tea, fruit punch, and in the morning, coffee. And by the way, their coffee is really good. Near the food courts, you'll see vending machines that sell Gatorade. You can also buy it at the camp store. A paramedic told me that Gatorade isn't very good for rehydration. It replaces electrolytes, but does little else. And even then, you have to be mindful of what electrolytes you're trying to replace. Sodium or potassium and magnesium. Many people make sconja bean and bring it to Penzik. Sconja bean is a vinegar-based rehydration drink from ancient Persia that's flavored with cucumber, honey, and mint. Some encampments have coolers of it for common use. I would make it less sweet than the recipe calls for because sugar is dehydrating. Sconja bean works because vinegar has rehydration properties and restores electrolytes. For the same reason, you might try shrubs, which were vinegar-based drinks popular in 18th century England. In my opinion, here's how the three options line up. Sconja bean is best, then Gatorade, then water. There's debate on the subject. Both Gatorade and Sconja bean replace electrolytes, but are they the right electrolytes? And both contain a lot of sugar which in itself is dehydrating. All I can say is try them out and see what works for you. Finally, many people swear by Noom tablets. You dissolve one in a glass of water to restore your electrolytes. Now let's talk about what to wear to beat the heat at Penzik. I would recommend wearing only linen or silk. Surprisingly, Cotton is just too hot. My persona is Norman French, so I normally wear a knee-length overdress over a cotton shift. But not at Penzik. I won't make that mistake again. The first night of my first Penzik, it was my great good fortune that some of the merchants were still open at nine at night, and I was able to buy a linen dress that felt cool and comfortable. I felt like I was wrapped in it. What I learned is, cotton is too hot for Penzik, and multiple layers are unbearable. So if you find period garb to be uncomfortable in the heat, remember this. Northern Europe just doesn't get as hot and humid as we do. Plus, during the Middle Ages, Europe hadn't yet emerged from the Little Ice Age. People say they feel cooler when they're wearing a coif. Another trick for beating the heat is to soak your veil in the melted ice water of your cooler before putting it on. And nothing says you can't go out in public with wet hair. Straw hats are everywhere at Penzik. I'm much more comfortable when I'm wearing one. I like to tie a cord under the chin. That way, I'm not always chasing it down the street when the wind picks up. The unfortunate fact is that however beautiful Northern European clothing is, it was intended to be worn in northern European climates, which Pennsylvania, in August, is not. On the hottest days, 
you might choose to wear garb from warmer climates, such as the Mediterranean or the Middle East. For example, Roman garb is well suited to the heat. The tunica consists of two pieces of linen held together by a few buttons along the arm. It's made for hot and sticky weather. Another good choice for hot weather is a silk sari. They're inexpensive, and a number of merchants carry them. One displays them like a pile of leaves in front of her shop. On the hottest days, you see them being worn all over Pensick. This isn't period, but one thing you see from time to time is a battery-operated fan that sprays mist. Speaking as a veteran swim team parent, I can tell you that these are a good thing. Another thing that some people find useful is a first aid ice pack. It's worn on the back of the neck to make the heat more tolerable. And now for the last topic, staying cool in the tent. If you possibly can, install a vent flap in your tent. Hot air rises and it will get out through the vent. Choose a pale colored ground cloth. Pale colors don't get as hot. And finally, consider using clip-on battery-powered fans. These are rechargeable through a USB port, and they can give you some relief from the heat. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact me at uvathothehorseman at gmail.com.